All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this is number 17, a series of number 17 with Virtual Throws Conference. We're excited to be back after a couple weeks off. We have Coach Dale Stevenson here and are excited for that today. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, Coach Stevenson is the lead throws coach for Athletics New Zealand. He is also um, the coach to world champion Tom Walsh and is a Olympian himself from 2012 in the shot put. Um, so we're really excited to have him here today and share a little bit about his history and, and what he's doing with uh, Athletics New Zealand. And um, before we turn it over to him, just a big thank you to the National Throws Coaches Association for helping us get the word out and sponsoring this event. And of course, to MF Athletic and everything track and field for uh, continuing to sponsor us, um, giving away some gift cards and all that good stuff every week. And uh, we appreciate you, the listeners, and hopefully you learned something this week. So without further ado, uh, thanks, Dale, for joining us. Thanks, to Rob, for being here. Um, we'll kick it off. Just we'd love to hear a little bit about you and, and how you got you know into your position at, with Athletics New Zealand and and where you're coming from in the sport. And um, yeah, turn it to you. Yeah. Firstly, thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate uh, the time and being flexible, trying to figure out uh, times to do this across continents. So I, um, it's always a pleasure to connect and especially at the moment. So lovely to chat with everyone. And um, yeah, to answer your question, I, I guess working backwards, I've been here in New Zealand since 2014. Uh, I'm Australian. Uh, born and raised, competed for Australia in a previous life and retired uh, in 2012 uh, after the Olympics, which was probably the the um, culmination of my career, I suppose. And I retired relatively young. Um, I was sort of battling some injuries and um, was always probably realistically undersized as a shot putter, an international shot putter, but I loved it and worked really hard at it and, um, and enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, I... 2063 was my PB and um, still is my PB. It's probably never going to get beaten now, but um, that was uh, that was competitive back in the day. But, uh, not um, not so much anymore. But yeah, look, I, I was sort of had a, a journeyman like career, um, and yeah, then packed it up and I was teaching for a few years. Uh, teacher, I taught uh, all through my my athletic career to to pay the bills, and uh, then an opportunity came up. To come over here and, and work with Tom um, for a couple of years. It was originally just a pretty fixed term deal through 2014, 2015, 2016, through until Rio Olympics. And we, we managed to, to get some things going there for a few years and, and ended up uh, with Tom taking a, taking a medal home from, from Rio, which was great. And the, the Federation here said, hey, is this something you'd be interested in doing ongoing? And really, for me, that meant. You know, the next chapter of my life involved uh, a family and um, building a squad and putting a bit of a footprint down here beyond just uh, working with Tom. And so that's been that's been me now. I've been here now seven years. I'm going to have, in a few weeks' time, I'm going to have two New Zealand-born daughters. And um, yeah, it's really become become our home now, which is uh, which is exciting. And it's a great place to live. But uh, we do we do stay try and stay connected to to the rest of the world. One of the pitfalls of being here is that we're tucked away in this little island corner of the world, which is a beautiful place to live. But um, yeah, realistically, we know that the the, the locus of, of our sport happens where you guys are and in Europe. So um, we've got to spend a bit of time on the road if we if we want to be big players um, on the global scene. But yeah, fortunately, we, we managed to make some connections with, with people like Rob and yourself, Brandon, who, who help us out to, um, to stay connected and not feel so isolated, tucked away in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> Awesome. And, you know, speaking of big players, you know, you have, you're not just coaching Tom anymore. Like you have, you know, a pretty um, baller squad through Athletics New Zealand of, of throwers. And can you talk more, a little more about your role with Athletics New Zealand and how, you know, you've, you've come to have this great throws group and kind of where you're going there? Yeah. So about, um, about 10 years ago, it really originated before I got here with a strategic decision that was made by uh, our high performance sport, our national government federation and uh, Athletics New Zealand, who are my employer, that New Zealand really doesn't have the depth. We've got a population of just under 5 million people. Um, mm. We don't have the depth or the resources to be competitive in, in all events globally or all sports. I mean, we could, we could throw 
a big chunk of the national GDP at trying to trying to create a men's basketball team, but we're not going to realistically we're never going to be competitive with even a D1 collegiate team. We just don't have the players. You know, we might get a one-off like we got. Stephen Adams, who plays for Oklahoma or whatever, but we needed a different strategy than, than what works for you guys. And uh, one of the things that came out of that was, as far as athletics goes, we needed to prioritise event groups uh, over other event groups. So um, New Zealand's got a bit of a history and a heritage in, in middle distance. Uh, we've had a number of 1,500 and mile um, medalists and, and world record holders in the past, and even still recently with Nick Willis still flying the flag for that event group. And and throws has been another big uh, emphasis for us around wh where we can be competitive on the world stage. So we channel a fair amount of our uh, funding and resources towards throws events. So we've got a number of employed throws coaches um, and we, we, there's money tagged for things like professional development to, to help us stay, stay current and stay ahead of the curve. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, that's the origin of it. And then as part of that, we've got a number of, we've got realistically probably two and two main throws hubs in New Zealand where we've got employed coaches, uh, like a national training centre. If you think like a Chula Vista, but scaled down a little bit, but essentially the same. Um, a number of our best athletes funded training together. Uh, one in Christchurch, which is where I am and what I look after, and then another one in Auckland, which is our, our biggest city and our biggest population base. So um, that's kind of how it's come together. And yeah, we are, we're quite targeted with, with who um, we work with in the, at that level. But uh, yeah, striking the balance between making sure we keep the sport alive and, and coaching club level athletes and school level athletes to keep the upwards pressure coming on is, is always important because we don't have a, a high school and collegiate system that's as strong as the US. But uh, really when we get someone who comes through uh, with the, the potential to go on and, and do what Tom's done and what Valerie's done and what Jacko's done and, and now a couple of the other girls coming up underneath really is uh, to make sure they get looked after and, um, and nurtured yeah, Dale. Why don't you mention some of some of the others? Uh, we we were just previously talking before we came on about Lauren's big throw this past week, seventy three yeah. forty seven in the hammer, which is the national record. You got yeah. Lauren, obviously, and she's 22, 23 years old, maybe. Yeah, yes, yeah. I think she just turned twenty three. So she's um she's a classic one. I mean, if Lauren, two years ago Lauren was barely breaking sixty meters in the hammer, and she was doing a bit of hammer, a bit of discus. Um, she's from a gymnastics background. Um, it was kind of, if she was in the collegiate system, she would have just dropped out the other side. And, Man. you know, if, you, if you're not throwing 70 plus at 22, then realistically, there's not a real pathway for you. But um, we've been able to take our time here and build some of that up. And she only really specialized in hammer uh, a year ago in October, less than a year ago. And in that time, she went to 68 over our summer, which is your winter. Uh, and, and then now training through through our winter and coming out the other side first competition or set of competitions back and throwing throwing an, an area record for Oceania which is um which is exciting so th that's the kind of the downside of what we do is that you know we talked about being remote a challenge but also we can take our time with some of those projects and make sure that with a, a long-term view in mind that there's no reason someone like Lauren uh Lauren Bruce can't be competitive for the next you know two three Olympic cycles hmm. I didn't realize I I always thought Lauren was from Christchurch. She's actually from Timaru, isn't she? She's from Timaru, which is Tom's hometown. So um, <laughs> yeah, so they actually had the same junior coach, which is a, a cool yeah. little um, tip of the hat to him, a guy named Ian Baird oh. from Timaru, who's a, a volunteer coach down there who does an amazing mm -hmm. job. And then uh, he kind of, he, he's an older, retired guy, uh, passionate about the sport. He'll co he coaches everyone from mm -hmm. five-year-old kids through until high schoolers. But um, by his own admission, that's probably about his cap of what he can um, he can give, and he does an amazing job of, of promoting the sport. And then, yeah, both both Lauren and Tom have come from South Canterbury, which is about two hours south, an hour and a half south of Christchurch. And then they they live in Christchurch now and, and train in Christchurch. But uh, yeah, it, it's quite an amazing um, parallel there with their journeys. But then we've got athletes from all over the country. In fact, when I look at we've got we've got a system here called carding, which is like a, a tier level um, funding level. Uh, structure, I suppose, and we've got a number of carded athletes, uh, carded throwers here in Christchurch. I think we've had maybe four or five or six carded athletes over the last few years here, and none of them are from Christchurch. 
uh, you oh, know, really? they, all, they all move here and relocate, so oh. including myself. So it's become a real hub for uh, for people. Like you, if you come to Christchurch, you're coming here for for one of a few reasons, and um, and throwing's becoming one of them, which is cool. So how about so you have Nick Palmer and uh, Ryan Valentine? Yep. Want to talk about them a little bit? If people yeah, don't so know they, who they are, I'm sure young, most people do. Yeah, two young shot putters. Um, again, uh, Nick's still a teenager and. Uh, and Ryan's just turned 21. He's um, he's throwing about 20 meters, but uh, he, he made the final at World Juniors a few years ago. And um, yeah, he'll he'll be one to watch. Similar trajectory, like he's he's not uh, he's not a jacko, but not many are, you know. So he, they're, they're kind of on a different path, and they bring a heap to the training environment here as well as being good athletes in their own right. So getting that chemistry right's um, pretty critical and making sure that everyone gets what they need in their own tailored pro approach, but also getting the daily training environment right. Because you guys have seen, if you look at where, where legacies of success have come from, you know, longitudinal success, think of Finland with javelin throwing, you think of Hungary with hammer throwing, you think of now what the Germans are doing with javelin, and obviously the US has had some really strong pockets with Benegas and Jard and Babbitt and all these kind of great coaches who've been around, you know, Blue Trick and what they've done is not just one athlete, it's kind of been systematic approach that um, provides the opportunity for athletes to come come through and, and, and that's the kind of structure that we're trying to put in place now is obviously to support those those ones like like a Tom who's at, at the top of his game, but but also to make sure it doesn't extinguish when when Tom passes. Hmm. You have you have We've talked about this. You have similar situations to the U.S. Uh, and and uh, as you know, in, in Europe too. But in in the U.S., obviously, a lot of athletes a, lo a lost track athletes could be lost to football uh, or other sports. And in New Zealand, I'm sure you lose quite a quite a few good ones to rugby and maybe cricket and some of the other sports too. Yeah, we do. Um, rugby is the national sport here. Uh, yeah. the, all, the all Blacks, our national rugby team, are a, yeah. uh, a huge source of national pride, um, and and rightly so. You know, we don't we don't begrudge that. We'd be we're setting ourselves up for failure if we try and go head to head against against rugby. Um, but rugby is a huge asset for us, and it's part of the cultural fabric of, of New Zealand. So we we try and work in with that where we can. In fact, uh, to give you an example, we've got. Tom's review uh, tomorrow, so we do an annual review up to, up to the end of the season. And the guy who's facilitating that for us is the the All Blacks scrum coach. So there's kind of cross pollination there. Who, um, yeah, and we uh, we're working together with them for professional development, and we've yeah. developed some really good linkages. So trying to make that complementary rather than um, conflict. But yeah. yeah, again, that's just part of the uh, part of the nature of being in a small country with fixed resources and fixed numbers of people is we can't use market forces, you know, like there's a certain amount of that in the U S that, you know, every D one college is going against every D two college is going against every D three college. And there's, there's this kind of arms race to, to get better and better, which works that that's capitalist kind of system works well in the U S but um, we have to be a bit more collaborative uh, with how we do things here. And yeah, going, going against rugby in New Zealand is setting yourself up for failure. It's a bit like trying to go against football in the South. It's not going to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in, in the U.S. and on the high school level, the, the the track coach that is also the football coach is a optimal uh, situation because he gets most of his uh, kids out for track from the football team. But with your young, with your young, younger athletes now, you're starting to you getting some. Uh, I want to don't want to say pressure, but you getting a lot of inquiries from from U.S. coaches, collegiate coaches. Always. <laughs> Always. Always. And. Um, and rightly so. That's a compliment, you know. Like uh, for for a long time, yeah. we we didn't have the the structure in place in New Zealand to, and even Australia to support someone who wanted to become a world class thrower. There were pockets, but you, yeah. if, if if you had to move, you know, if you were from a, a small country town or not not one of the main centres, you would have had to move, let's say, from somewhere like Timaru to Auckland. Now, if you're going to move from Timaru to Auckland, what's the difference between that and moving from Timaru to LA and getting your education paid for and competing against the best guys. So it's quite an, it was quite an appealing options. And I just feel like the tide, the, the, the tide starting to turn um, on that now. And people are saying, Hey, maybe I don't have to go, um, you know, to a, to a D one college to, to further my, um, my athletic pursuits. But 
that said, I still think there's a time and a place for the collegiate route for some of our athletes and it's the right thing to do. And yeah, what, what you guys have got there is such a huge untapped asset. And I mean, it's not that it's fully untapped. You make, certainly make the most of it and there's great athletes come out the other side. But yeah, when we look at an, an NCAAs and see, you know, the standard of all the events across the board, it's uh, we, we simply can't play that game because we don't have the numbers. Some of our events are really strong, like women's shot, men's shot, now women's hammer strong. But women's discus is... You know, 55 metres would probably win our national championships. Anything over 50 would get a medal at our nationals. So it's not like every event has got Tom and Jacko and Val and all these these people. Work. That's just part of well, how... That's, and again, we, we've talked about this before. That's all part of perception too. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, in the US, and this is not... Uh, not if you take the javelin and the, the javelin in the US, I mean... If we ever got somebody throwing 80 meters, that's wow, that's great. You know, uh, we we've, we've had people there in, in the past, but you know, then you start <laughs> getting into the the mid 80s or 90s. I mean, God, it's just. But the perception is that now, if you throw uh, that certain distance, you're going to be at you know the top of the game, but you may be at the top of the game in the U.S., but not not overall. Totally. And, and, then not, you, that, and of course, there's a lot of great 70 to 80 meter javelin does not to, to yeah, of take course, them but, I mean, Yeah. In terms of understanding yeah. global standards, that's like, yeah. even if you go to the New Zealand secondary school comp uh, championships, which is, you know, all of the, all of the high school kids from around, from around the country every year, there'll yeah. be a couple of boys over 18 meters, a couple of girls over seven, you know, 16, 17 meters. Um, that's pretty good, you know. It's, it usually gets one 20 meters plus, you know. Both those guys, um, Nick, Nick Palmer and Ryan, who train here, they thrown they threw 21 and a half uh, minimum as, as schoolboys. So, you know, 70 feet as a schoolboy uh, is kind of it, it puts you in the mix. Um, but then, as you say, it, it, shot puts kind of here, so people aren't afraid in New Zealand of throwing 70 feet. It's not mysterious. They kind of go, mm -hmm. oh yeah, well. Jacko did it. Jacko threw like 85 feet or whatever the hell he did. Yeah. Jacko, Tom, Tom's done it. You know, Ryan's done it every year. So they, they get kids coming through and they're not afraid to do that. Whereas, you know, it, it's to see someone throw 80 meters kind of opens the door to in, in, in javelin. You go, oh, it's not so scary. I could maybe do that. <laughs> yeah. You get this kind of bell curve of, um, yeah, competition, which if you can use it to your advantage is great, but everything goes in cycles. Who knows what will be next? Yeah. Not to circle us back, but I'm curious, you know, you, you talk about college interest and in some, you know, uh, U.S. college interest in some of your, your students, your athletes. How do you how do you kind of deal with that? Because, you know, I can see, like you said, there's some certainly some good points to the, of the of the U.S. system. Like you're on these big teams, you get to compete more, you know, pretty frequently and, and you know, have resources and things like that. But also, you know, we talked with Tom a lot about long term development and being able to take your time. And that's certainly a weak point of our system of you know everything's a four-year cycle whether it's high school college um you know what kind of goes into making that decision for for those individual athletes that's got to be tough yeah um it's case by case and as far as the best approach we're, we're trying to get a dialogue going with our athletes and we, we know who they are um in new zealand there's only ever a handful of them who are sort of we know that they're going to be of interest and they're going to be yielding like Connor Bell is one at the moment, you know, who's through 63 meters with the 2K, he's still a high school, um, high school discus thrower. Like, you know, we know that he's got interest, so we'll talk with Connor about it and say, look, really, if if an honor come, if an offer comes up for you to go and, you know, train in a great environment with it in the right setting, you know, fortunately, you know, I've, I've got connections and we've got connections with people like Rob and 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 others in the in the US who, who I would trust to, to help guide those decisions. Um, and as I said, it's not a, it's not a flat out no, but I guess we need to lay out the information to the, to those athletes ahead of time and say, here are the pros of the U of going to college and here are the cons of going to college. And, and it's, it's not a, we, we try to do that in an unbiased objective way because it, it really, from a selfish perspective with the, um, with running a system here, like we can outsource to, for a certain to a certain degree like just say hey look we don't have to pay for this we don't have to think about it you, you can go here to this great 
set up and structure, but we've got to make it work for you. And, and I mean, Julia Ratcliffe did that. She, she won NCAAs and, um, and came back and then has won a Commonwealth Games and she's now here, you know, furthering her career as a hammer thrower and, and along with her professional career. So there's an example of someone who, who's done it well. We like to pin out, you know, pin down those ones who go to, go to college and get burned out and there's that upwards pressure to get good really quick and injuries and all that kind of stuff that comes with the territory. But um, that's not the case for everyone and just having those conversations up front so that they know where they're getting into because there's certainly, if you're from rural New Zealand tucked away in the, you know, this little quadrant of the globe and, and someone from, you know, New York or Ohio or wherever comes knocking on your door and says, hey, come come see us and we'll give you a track suit and, um, you know, pay for your comp, pay for your education. That's that's a pretty big carrot. So um, mm-hmm. we just got to got to make sure we um, let them know what, what, what it is that they're, they're getting into and, and what that it's not the only option. Very cool. I was, uh, by the way, <clears throat> I was... Uh... How'd you make it through the whole COVID situation? And uh, also uh, winter training, like Tom hasn't been around for winter in a long time. <laughs> yeah, look, I, um, I've known Tom for a long time and yeah. this is, I, I, we know each other. <laughs> we know each other as well as pretty much anyone. And um, <laughs> I got to tip my hat to him because the last six months has been really tough for Tom. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Tom, you know, Tom, his natural habitat is being around people, competing against the best guys. Like, he, he's the guy who wants to compete every day, all the time. And that's that's when he's at his best. And to have that taken away and say, we're going to go mm-hmm. through a Christchurch winter where we, we, we had snow, you know, like the, the circle freezes over here and um, trying to do that on your own. And yeah, he's got training partners and all the rest, but for a guy who, you know, especially coming off the back, Tom had some pretty strong fire burning after throwing 22, <laughs> 22.90 at World Champs last year and, and not even, you know, getting in the top two. So that was, he, to, to, he was pretty keen to channel that and get back on the horse and let's go and get ready for Tokyo. And obviously everyone's in the same situation as far as um, timings go, but yeah, certainly watching some of those guys have, comp- you know, good competitions available to them, even recently, and I know it's not many, but, yeah. Um, yes, we we're sitting here going, man, it'd be nice to be part of that. So that was um, that's been tough, but it's going to get better um, and and come back online. And yeah, look, he's through it. He's through the worst of it now. And um, certainly, as a country, New Zealand's in a pretty good place. We're we're down to what we call level one restrictions now, which is yeah, you, bars are open, sporting events are open, we can have crowds, you know, all around the country. So it's it's kind of in the grand scheme of things. Shot put's not the be all and end all, but uh, yeah. Yeah, certainly for it's been tough on that front. For me personally, the, the saving grace has been uh, my family. You know, I've, yeah. I've been able to channel more energy to jumping on the trampoline with my daughter and you know chasing her around the house and all that kind of stuff, which is which has been a real um, a nice distraction, I guess. When uh, it sucks as well because as coaches we like to be there doing the doing the same stuff as the athletes and and sort of not living vicariously through them, but there is, there's a, there's a, yeah. a passion that we do it, the reason that we got into the sport. And um, it's not like we're, you know, college football coaches who get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, to do this for, for other incentives. The, the reason, you know, and, and to be fair, like seeing, seeing Lauren throw that on the weekend gives me the satisfaction that keeps me coming back for more. But um, yeah, certainly then this stage, changes and you want it then you go well actually what if we can go and do that and let's go and do that find go where deanna's throwing and see if we can do that there or let's go where Krause is throwing and see if you can do that there and that's um that's the stuff that pushes the buttons that we haven't been able to do which has been tough but um I, we certainly haven't gone backwards tom's tom's done a great job of, of recognizing that and he's kept his training up all the way through it, um at a pretty high standard but he's ready for a break now and we'll, we'll see what happens going into 2021 if Tom did go to, just say, he went to Europe for a meet or two, when he got back, you'd have to quarantine for a couple of weeks, right? Yeah, it's 14, 14 it, day quarantine. Yeah. yeah, and it's not a, uh, people need to understand, it's not a, like a self quarantine in your own home, right? It's, it's a, like no, you're in a military base yeah. or a hotel and you're, you're watched. So it's a, yeah. a, a total, complete quarantine. So it's a tough total thing quarantine. To do. New Zealand's gone really hard on, um, on yeah. trying to eradicate COVID. And we've had, you know, we've gone, uh, we haven't had cases here for uh, 
uh, you know, any case or single digit cases, and they've all come from uh, people coming into the country. So that's the quarantine, the purpose of the quarantine, and it's it is it's fourteen day quarantine as it stands at the moment, um, and you can't get around that. So that said, we've already chatted, and it's it's no uh, no surprise. But uh, ne- next year, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes, and we'll especially for Tom, we need to get he needs to get offshore and compete against the best guys because that's when he's at his best and um it's tokyo will happen in whatever way shape or form it happens and um we've got to be there and in the mix and if we if we choose to roll over and lick our wounds now because of a 14-day quarantine then all of that good works kind of undone so yeah. um, we'll be up for it and we just got to be a bit more um considered with our planning and conversations with government and the olympic committee and things like that they're all happening at the moment but yeah look uh, it's so been a, it's I, been a well, if i come down to visit and I have to be quarantined for 14 days. Can I do it at Cape Kidnappers? You could bring a golf club. <laughs> Maybe you can hit them. There is, I won't you know, bother anybody. <laughs> we were, that's what I mean. There's worse places to quarantine. We, um, Tom and I actually went up there and we played Cape Kidnappers mid-year and got a beautiful, crisp uh, yeah. winter's morning and, and went out. It was, uh, it was glorious. So we we're fortunate to, to have places like that to go. But... Yeah, look, yeah, anytime you come down, Rob, you, you know where to find us. <laughs> Before we get into any like nitty gritty, speaking of you yeah. and Tom playing golf, I hear he's a little bit competitive with you from time to time <laughs> in just oh about anything he can be. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's probably, Tom's just like that annoying younger brother who <laughs> just doesn't come um, And I'm, I'm in a different phase of life now than I was when I was competing and um i don't have the energy to do that all the time but every now and then you just need to make sure you put your athletes back in their right place so um and i i am i am actually a better golfer than tom and i think he knows that and it annoys him because all of his shot putting stuff's better than mine ever was i I had literally have nothing left to say or i was better than that i can't even do the old man thing now and say back in my day i used to score more than this because i can't and i never did he's just a better better shopper than i was but i've got him on the golf course so every now and then i just dale Dale shot a legitimate 74 at st andrews back uh, a few years ago I did, yeah. Oh, that's that, was, that was a highlight. That was straight up uh, after Tom won for champs. So that was, yeah. a, was a good little highlight. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Dale, you, did, you were coach. Gus uh, Pulapolo was your coach, right? Yeah, yeah, I had done that. And, and uh, I mean, did did you learn a lot? I mean, he's such a, he's a, he's such a great guy. He's another one of these guys that is just, a wonderful person to be around is is that did you did you learn a lot of your 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 present uh philosophies from gus yeah i, I did and i i had a i probably had three really formative influences as far as coaches go um the first one was a guy named john eden who was a, a paralympian uh who was my first coach and he coached me through him basically through high school and then i moved to train with gus uh and gus saw me through you know a good chunk of my development and you know specializing as a shot putter first time over 20 meters all that kind of stuff and and then uh working with babbitt who who helped me with the last sort of two years of my career and then also transitioning into coaching as a mentor for me and um yeah look if you if i had to pick a, a spectrum of, of of people to help mentor me through into a coaching pathway then then i was i was incredibly fortunate to have access to some pretty great ones and you know so, Babbitt from a highly structured, highly professional, uh, you know, American lens on things, but also he's got that kind of scientific view on, on, on the way he operates. And then Gus, who was a, a volunteer coach, uh, he was a hammer thrower from, you know, back in the 60s and 70s yeah. and moved off his own, but, you know, from he's an Italian immigrant to Australia and then decided I wanted to throw hammer. You know, the guy's like five foot two and... <laughs> <laughs> and just and said, if I want to be any good at this, so he moved, lived out of a suitcase uh, in Germany for a few years, just as a as a disciple of hammer throw, soaked it up training there, and then from from Leverkusen came back, and now he's he's had decades of success and dozens of you know Australian representatives across throws events for 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 decades now, and and um, he's still doing his thing at the same track. He's there every night. I made a, I called him 
try and call him every month, you know, every couple of weeks and have a chat. And um, yeah, he'll be he'll be there till he kicks the bucket. He's a he's a legend. <laughs> and, um, so from him and then and then John, who is still on the scene, um, you know, started working with John when yeah. I was thirty years old, and and he's still coaching. And now he's to get to get a message like when when Lauren throws on the weekend, and you know, to break an area record in that, and the first person that you get a text from or a handshake from is John. That means a lot um, from someone who's known me for so long and and in different versions of my life. It's, you know, from from a teenager to now I'm in my, in my mid-30s, it's, um, it's it's so nice to have those meaningful connections. And, yeah, like the, the media stuff and the extrinsic reward around uh, gratification that come with awards and trophies and things like that for athletes is kind of cool at first, but then it erodes and... And it's really the the connections that you're left with. So I'm I'm incredibly grateful that th- those relationships are worth more than than anything else um, to me now. Very cool. Uh, speaking you of, want to get into some uh, technical stuff now, Brandon? Yeah, sure. Um, I know we're gonna watch some video of Tom at some point, but I got a couple questions. You know, just thinking back from our visit with Tom earlier this spring. Um, you know, he talked a lot about, and we've mentioned a little bit here too, of like, um, really pacing yourselves and making sure you're taking a, a long-term view of, of development and training and being patient. And I'm just curious, you know, from your view, what does some of that look like that you're, you know, you do differently to kind of, um, you know, optimize that long-term development that you, you know, as opposed to maybe a U.S. high school or U.S. college coach might be doing. Um, yeah, it's, um, or just how do you go about it, you know? Yeah, how do we go about it? Good question. Um, so, when we plan out a season, um, one advantage we we have is that we don't have a really uh, a tough U.S. nationals or Olympic trials or something like that. So, we can really sit down now and look at it with a clean slate. We know Tom's qualified for for whatever the next major championship is, and say, well, this is the performance. It, it, it here is the priority. And let's structure everything else off that, um, and then we work we work back from there. Mm. The and then there's things that you have to negotiate along the way, like he's, he has to compete at Prefontaine because he's a Nike athlete, and that's part of their contract and all that kind of stuff. But that's not too detrimental, I guess. If you can build a number of years, so you think, okay, not only what do we need to throw at the next conference championships or the next U.S. championships or whatever, because you've got to pay the bills. Um, to, to say, well, actually, what is, what do we want? Where do we want Tom to be at in four years' time, in eight years' time, and how do we, how do we work on that and prioritise that? And if that means going backwards to go forwards a little bit, then we've got time to do it. Um, so that's uh, that's certainly been an advantage for us. Uh, I'll see if I can pull up uh, something in my show uh, here. If you've got any other questions, but I'll just be one sec. Or see if I can yeah, sure. grab a, something that might help explain that. Um, we can do screen share here yeah you should be enabled uh green Uh, button and yeah you're you're on it you're on it you getting this you getting this document here oh yeah cool so this is Tom's plan from last year. You see Doha World Champs down there? Yep. Uh, and so we have a, that's what I talked about, like prioritizing events, pinnacle event, and then priority one, two, three. So that's kind of how we, we structure it. Start with these, which is that, and uh, obviously this year Olympics and World Indoors, which has been reshuffled. But So let's put that first. So that's week zero from pinnacle. And then we work back from there. So we kind of know what Tom needs for like six weeks leading into that comp maintenance. Um, and then we just plug in. So next tier of meets, cool. We know Tom needs a couple of competitions to get in shape for a major championship. He has to do this one. That's always outside of the Diamond League final. It's probably the next best comp on the calendar anyway. Mm-hmm. All the best guys are there. So let's do that. And then New Zealand championships is the other one that has to um that we sort of pride ourselves on making sure we compete there each year and then from there we can block out okay i think you guys have you know us champs in here 
normally somewhere if we're if we're already there like july mid july something like that um there's an opportunity for us here to get in two training cycles and and make sure that that six week run through to doha is uncompromised so while you guys are pounding away at each other you know trying to make the team which you've got to do um let's seize that opportunity and see if we can um put a put a bit more money in the bank for for this little run in here so that's the kind of the live the way that we think about it um obviously there's some logistics that go with that so we have pre-camp here in cyprus and then tom's this is athens georgia tom's got a house there um that rob's been to and knows where we are there at uga so um yeah we work through Work through all those logistics. Melbourne's my hometown, so we spent a couple of weeks there just to break up the the New Zealand summer. And um, fortunate to still have some good relationships there. And then, kind of, this is this is all how it ends up. And that Very wasn't cool. a bad one to finish, but just not quite enough. So there's a um, there's a little snapshot of kind of how we uh, how we think about it, I suppose. Um, and I don't know if if that answers your no, that's, that's question. Great. Yeah, and then just kind of an offshoot of that, you know, that's that's Tom, and um, you talked about, you know, the chemistry of the group, you know, like you have these other people that you're training with, and, you know, you're all, they're all in kind of different places of, of their careers, and I'm sure working on different things and different training, or what are some what are th- some things you're doing to really, you know, maintain that chemistry, even though I would I would assume at least that people are kind of doing all sorts of different things based on exactly what they need. Yeah, it's um it's an imperfect science and it's always a, a dynamic thing. One thing that really became apparent for me here was that I, I couldn't do this on my own. I needed some help. Uh, so I'm really lucky to have access to, you know, a, a great physiotherapist who I work closely with uh, and she helps me uh, on a lot of that side of things. And, and now I've got uh, some assistant coaching help as well, uh, which is helps me take the load off some of the delivery stuff. So it means I don't have to be at every gym session. I don't have to um, necessarily be bound to first one in, last one out uh, all the time, which has then opened up space for me to spend time with my family, which means that I'm invigorated when I come back to training and I'm not just ground into the dirt, grizzled old kind of disenfranchised coach, which we see so many of too. Um, And if I want to stay passionate about it, then I I need to do it in line with uh, doing the other things in my life and, making sure, you know, once every couple of weeks I can get out for a hit on the golf course and that kind of thing. So that's, um, that, as I said, it's an imperfect science and, and the interpersonal dynamics is a big one, getting that right. So making sure that, uh, you know, Tom gets what's he, what he needs, some upwards pressure from the, from the younger boys training with him and someone like Ryan's, you know, he's closing the gap really, really fast now on Tom um, in, the, in the gym setting, not quite in throwing yet because he just hasn't had the, the years under his belt. But... They, they work great together, so let's prioritise a couple of times a week for their main sessions when they can go at each other in the gym setting. And then, hey, maybe for throwing, we need a bit more time and nuance, so let's do those throwing sh- sessions separately. And, you know, we'll do a session here and a session here. And then maybe on a on a Saturday, which is usually at the, sort of the back end of our training week, um, we'll come together and they can finish with a mock competition going at each other on a, on a Saturday and set a handicap and, you know, play, play for something or that's uh that's kind of the way that it's it's manifest and it works and um it's not to say it'll always work we have to be mindful of that and um different different things put push different buttons for different athletes but um certainly yeah th- there's there's a lot of work that goes into making sure the environment's right because if that's not right your reps and sets don't really matter yeah great uh we've got one question from youtube i'll ask then maybe rob we could you guys get uh to hammer out some video stuff <clears throat> Um, so this well, is, well, you guys keep talking. I'll see if I can pull something up. Perfect. So Does Allison O'Rourden is asking, what type of athlete coach relationship do you have with Tom? Oh, Allison, good to hear from you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look at that picture of Rob. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, athlete coach relationship. It's different. It's different now to what it was when we started. Um, Tom and I started as competitors, and. Uh, yeah, one of my points of pride over Tom is that he actually never beat me. Uh, I think I just retired in time <laughs> to get out of the way. So, um, yeah, we need, but we also acknowledged up front that that, that had to change over time and that uh, 
we needed to have robust, tough discussions at times. And in order to do that, we needed some separation and some professionalism in, the, in how we do things. So um, I deliberately, the, I think the first year we went away, 2015 maybe, Tom and I were on the road for five months together, mm-hmm. you know, sharing, you know, uh, apartments and things like that, training all around the world. And, uh, the thought of doing that now doesn't appeal to either of us. I think we just need a bit more time and space and independence. And um, yeah, I guess we'd probably move more towards a traditional coach athlete relationship, but it's, it's bedded on a, a pretty strong um, foundation of, of time and, and shared experience and mutual respect. I guess we, we're different. Tom and I are not the same. Um, we have different values and, and we have different personalities, but uh, I think we, we see each other for that, or for what it is, and, and respect each other's differences. And um, that's kind of coupled with probably uh, one of our, our biggest underpinning things is just around honesty and openness. And um, that's that's put us in pretty good stead because it's no different to a, a marriage or a, uh, any other kind of relationship where you have to work at it and, and, and you have to, you have to, things change. Um, and it doesn't mean that I, I have any less respect for Tom. In fact, it means I've got more. Um, but Tom at, Tom at 28, he's, he's got a partner and a, a lifestyle section that he, you know, a block of land that he bought where he wants to build his house and do all that kind of stuff. And that, that's him, you know, he, that's what pushes his buttons. He, he likes business and golf and people and all that kind of stuff. And I would rather probably, I've got a, a stack of books sitting here that I want to get through. <laughs> that's that's how I want to spend my time between that and jumping on the trampoline and working with other athletes is that's kind of what I find energy positive. So, um, yeah, I think we've, we've done a pretty good job so far of navigating that. But um, as I said, every now and then, just making sure I kick his ass on the golf course. So that's, <laughs> you can keep the hierarchy in the right place. <laughs> Very cool. Um, hey Dale, I was trying to pull up a fo- uh, some uh, videos of uh, which I can't seem to do. But do would- you have anything hey, what are you after? around 2016 before prior to the Olympics? I do. Here we go. Uh, prior to the Olympics, how about let me see what I can do here. Uh, like I had some some things here, uh, like when we were in Athens, right before right before. This one, this is August. the day. This is the day before the Olympics. This is in Rio. Okay. Okay. That's probably not his best throw, but. Uh, This is by far the best video has ever worked on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now you were telling me in Athens, you know, in August of this year, of, of in 2016, uh, you were trying to get, you were working on his shoulders getting a little bit more level at the finish. Does that make sense? That he was dipping his left shoulder a bit? Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah. and that was in the the summer. Then you went to, uh, you know, to your competitions in to Rio, and that obviously looked like it got fixed. Yeah, let me let me see if I can pull something up. I'll show I'll show you a better example of that. But yeah, yeah basically one of the Tom's really strong uh, rotationally, but he has some um, he has some deficiencies around like over rotating and getting that in a straight line through the ball, one of which was dipping his left shoulder. Um, so we tried to straighten that up and I've, I've got a better example of it here. Just give me a second. Um, Okay. 
this is probably a better example here. So, this one here is from 2017. So this is just after what when you mentioned, Rob. Um, yeah. But both of these are at our, our national championships, and you'll see here what. Uh, what it is that maybe you and I were, were chatting about, and you can correct me if it's not, but. Um... Oh, this is it. You were, you were exactly, you were talking about a spine angle. Yeah. So that there is what we were trying to address. And there was a number of ways that we wanted to do that, but you can see kind of the tilt over to the left and then what we would call shearing forces. So Tom's going left when the shot's going straight. So he could never really maximize the finish. Um, and then it doesn't happen overnight. It took us a couple of years, but, uh, this is 2019 at our, our national championships again. Um, I can't remember exactly what this throw is, maybe high 21s, low 22, something like that, um, which wasn't his best of the year, obviously, but, uh, Mm. That was that was where we kind of got to with it, and that's realistically that's probably 80, 80 centimeters to a meter's worth of difference just in terms of time on the ball when it's traveling its fastest towards release. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, a, that's, that's a, a big difference. It's a big difference, and yeah, uh, I guess the the drop down ramifications of that were it's not just as simple as hey fix this and then it's fixed. There's yeah. There's a whole lot of strength and conditioning um, uh, philosophy that's gone into that, and time investment that to give him the the ability, the capacity, and the strength to be able to hold that shape when when you've got such huge pressure through the the finish of the throw. But um, yeah, certainly that's kind of a bigger project that it took us a few years to to make some ground on. Can you can you pull that one up again? That 2019 up again, or both from again? Yeah, sure. And if you can stop it right where his left arm is pointing towards the direction of throw. Off the back, you mean? The, no, at, at, at the, up the front. At the front. The one he gets, yeah. Uh, right, right, just a little bit before there. Right there. So, Brandon, this is exactly what Al Al was talking about in our previous session. Mm -hmm. You see where the, the, I mean, the ball is ultimately going to go to where the left arm is pointing. Yeah. And he got a nice long straight straight uh, linear drive or linear direction going there. But uh, uh, we with the deal yeah, we talked about this in our last session with with with. Uh, Coach Al, who's a great guy, he, he did a whole session on post-dominant uh, or uh, non-dominant side throwing. It was was basically the title, and we he was talking about lining it up just like Tom's lining it up right there, and all the drills that they were doing to line up, and and that 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 is exactly what he was exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, very cool, and. So what's what do you guys? I mean, as you, you sounds like you, yeah, wow, um, you know, th th at this point you're kind of tinkering and and you're working on things long term, and it's, there's no quick fixes. What are the what are the things you guys are kind of working towards now and tinkering with as you, you know, have had some time away from competition? And has that actually it's helped a little bit with some of these technical issues, or not issues, but yeah, just time? Uh, yeah, they're not really issues. They're just it's just progress. There's always something, you know. Um, you can never you can never beat the sport. Um, <laughs> I guess. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to pull that up, but <laughs> it's, it's very flattering. Look at me go. Where's that? Where were we? Oh, that was kidna kidnappers. Ah, true. That was uh, they, they would yeah. <laughs> God. Um, yeah, what are we working on now? If I tell you, I'd have to kill you, Brandon. That's, That's okay. Secret. Um, I can show you what we've done in the past, you know, show you Perfect. 2016, 2019 videos, but no, look, it's not no great secret. Tom's nowhere near tapped out yet. Um, he's got 
we've still got more distance to go. Um, and yeah, we've got the, the biggest difference is that training as a, as a 28, 28 year old is, is different to training as a 21 year old. Mm-hmm. And, and we have to factor that in. You, Tom's got some real gifts. We want to make sure that they they stay gifts and that we don't water those down. Um, but also kind of make sure he gets the, the, the stuff that he enjoys from the sport. And, yeah. and that is competing, especially this year that's become um, front and center for us. So, uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll chip away at some of the, the technical and physical uh, gaps that we want to close to, to throw. Or re- it's realistic to, to expect that we're going to have to go to Tokyo or, or, or Eugene World Champs or whatever comes online after that and, and have to throw, you know, 2350 um, to get on the top of the podium. So there's a, there's a pretty big carrot in front of us now with what Krause is doing. And um, yeah, we're not, we're not going to shy away from that. And uh, yeah, we, I wish I could give you more information, but I'm not going to. And That's maybe fair. in a few years' time, if we do this again, I can, <laughs> I can look back and say this is this was our spine angle comparison uh, from from 2020 through to 2022. But um, yeah, we, we've got a few things up our sleeve, and um, it, it's it, it's still exciting for all of us to be involved with. And um, yeah, as long as Tom wants to wants to do it and drives it, then um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep pushing and, and hmm. find a way to to make that ball go a little further. About some of your general training uh, uh, deal, specifically strength training. Uh, you don't have to yep. talk in you know real specific. We do this many reps or, or whatever, but just in general, some of the things that uh, exercises that that you may be doing at particular times of the year. Yeah, um, and, and do you and uh, are you doing different things with with Nick and Ryan than you are doing with Tom? Uh, why don't I show you? And then you can have okay. a look, okay? Um, this stuff's out in the universe, so I don't mind showing it to you already, but some of the stuff we do is like shot-specific overload stuff. Um, so that's a rotational overload. Here's a little one featuring uh, Jordan Clark for all those throws nerds out there. Try and get... Are you trying to share? I don't think you're sharing at the moment. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, apologies. One second. No problem. We've got two screens going on here and it's all happening. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, let's try this one. Are you getting a video of yep. it says each entry overload there? Yeah, just just popped up. Ah, perfect. See, this is some of the overloaded variations that we work through. What's going on on the left of the screen there? On this one? Yeah, so Tom's doing some rotational work and... Yeah. So this is just on a, a cable stack that we normally use oh, um, okay. and picking his hips. So we're getting some shoulder shoulder to hip separation, um, some trunk trunk separation, and then overloading the rotational rotational component of that. So you've got to get a little creative, obviously. Uh, oh, obviously with that. Uh, so we're getting, you're getting some eccentric movement in there with... Yeah, you're getting some eccentric movement yeah. through that. Okay. Um, and then I'll see if I can show you some more here. Um, what if we go to uh, this one here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm coming from a long way across the world here. <laughs> Excuse the video. So that's a little a little snippet of some of the, some of the stuff we do. Tom's limit is not maximal strength. He's still got some gains to make on his maximal strength, but by and large, it's his ability to apply force quickly 
um, that's going to be the, the difference that gets him from from 2290 to 2390 is uh, his ability to do it really fast. So you'll see most of those exercises are either really shot specific, rotational, um, or they're or they're really high rate of force development uh, exercises around applying the horsepower that he's got in a really small time window. Has, has this extra time, you know, um, during COVID kind of given you more experiment time or, or allowed you to do some things, you know, it's like some of those eccentrics. I know people, you know, people worry about soreness and kind of staleness for, you know, depending on what type of program you're running. Um, is that, you know, has this been a time you've been able to try some new stuff and, and, and finding some winners? Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Absolutely. We've, um, and we know so so some of the videos you just saw they're from that uh you know we looked at the 2019 plan just before they're from that window when you guys were competing in us champs and um so we would the ability to to do that and you you do take a hit in terms of throwing distances during that window so we'll throw a lot of shots try and offset that um during heavier training and make sure that the tempo and rhythm stays where it needs to be and uh that's kind of when you come out the other side of it and you combine the benefits of those overloaded eccentric patterns uh, with a, a stable rhythm and, and stable timing in throwing, then that's when you can kind of push to, to new levels. But it's, a, it's a, a long base that takes a while and then you kind of get these sharp spikes and then you try and set a new normal. Very cool. How'd you do on this hole, Dale? I think from memory, <laughs> I think there was three of us playing. I'm pretty sure I was... <laughs> I, I think I took two extra clubs just to make sure I didn't go in the canyon. And, you know, it might have been a seven iron and I hit like a five iron into the back bunker. But I'll take, I think I can't remember if I got up and down, but it, that's in Cyprus. That's a par three yeah. uh, awesome. canyon played. And you should ask Tom. I think we, they're still looking for about five of Tom's balls on that hole. <laughs> I, I guess I put that up because it was in Cyprus. It was in your, your training camp, right? It, it was camp. the back end of our training camp. Yeah, we yeah, thought that's so. Yeah. So you, you, you know, you guys still, you, you keep it, uh, it's serious, but you still keep it light, and you do some, do some other things too. And the big thing for Tom is keeping it, um, what we call energy positive. It has to be fun, and if it's not fun, he's yeah. not going to train well. If he's not training well, the shot's not going to go anywhere anyway. So uh, he has to be. Uh, we have to find something, and, and the trade off. For us, if that means, you know, going for a hit of golf, you know, we'd, we'll take a car, you know, so Tom's not walking 18 holes in the, in the heat. And, um, you know, we try and play pretty quickly and get off the golf course and make sure we, we're recovering and ready to go again for, for training the next day. And you do that, you know, do it on a rest day or you do it after your last training session of the week. So you've got time before training the next week. So we're pretty sensible about it. But um, certainly, otherwise, I mean, what do you, what do you finish your career with? You, Tom, you know, you got, 10, 15 years on the road traveling around the world and all you've seen is airports and hotels. That's not the kind of journey that's worthwhile. You need to, you need to, we talked about meeting, meeting people and developing relationships, but also just seeing the places that you, that you go. Okay, cool. Yeah, we got a question here that somebody, I can't tell who texted, but one of the, somebody texted over, they want to know when you're teaching young kids, mm -hmm. if you're doing a lot of drill work, how do you start with a lot of do you kind of do drill hole drill hole drill you know uh, hold drill hole again or what are what what are what are some of the things you teach in any event that you teach with, yeah, with young so kids from uh yeah with young kids i guess from a from a pedagogical teaching perspective when you're really young anything works so um yeah. go for whole movements is always great so I, i'm a big fan of uh, getting kids, if it's shot, getting them rotating, doing a full throw straight away. Just And if it goes all over the place, go all over the place. Throw a tennis ball, throw a softball, throw a one kilo shot, throw a whatever, and just get them comfortable feeling the circle, moving their body. And then, and then if you need to do small chunks, break it down. Okay, let's do a stand throw. Let's do a wheel. Let's do a South African, whatever. Um, but then bring it straight back to the whole throw because they that's what they see tom doing and that's what they see you know kovacs doing and that's then they go oh, they can connect the dots between what their kids learn by mimicry a lot and feel in and just giving them a lot of reps with not much feedback is um, often the best way to i've found to work with young kids mm -hmm. because it's not that they don't have the 
prefrontal cortex ability to to process complex demands, but they figure it out by play and feel. And uh, you know, kid, go just go to a kid's gymnastics class or a kid's you know t- pee wee football class. They they're just playing on instincts and and fun, and you're trying to erase that erase those instincts sets you up for for failure. Um, so try and keep that there, keep it fun, keep it light, let them throw in any direction. Don't worry about fouls. Um, come up with your own technique. Is there another way you can do it? Ask a lot of questions, keep it light, and then kind of give them what they want and slip in what they need, which is probably some guidance around tempo and acceleration and you know fundamentals of, of posture and biomechanics. But um, yeah, that would, that would be how I'd approach it. That's not to say that it's the right way to do it, but generally by and large now with kids in New Zealand, we're, we're trying to get them doing a whole throw, you know, with hammer, do do four turns and put, put them all in the cage or let's throw from the pad in front of the circle so that you feel good about getting some out of the cage rather than dumping every throw um, or maybe, you know, three turns or whatever's going to work for you. Throw a one kilo hammer and get get used to get your confidence up and, and aggression up when you're throwing and, and don't be afraid of it. And then from there, you've got a, a place that you can start to work in with your drills and skills and, and more specific uh I guess, targeted exercises. Very cool. Um, trying to just check in if we had any other things on YouTube real quick to keep up hey, on Dude, you want to uh, go through Doha a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got a hard out in about 10 minutes, but I'll, let's okay. go through Doha. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what about it? Where do you want to start? Just, no, no, leading up it. I mean, I've, Leading, leading up to uh, you know the, the the training week right before that, and leading up to yeah. the comp, and and you know being in Doha, which is you know a pretty hot place to be, and and everything that was going on in Doha, uh, and then the, the the actual comp, which was which you know that that competition ended up being the single best track and field competition in any event of all time. And, yeah. and they, they've shown all kinds of metrics for it. Uh, there's, there's some things that have come close, but, but that shot put event was not just the greatest shot put event of all time. It was the single greatest track and field event of all time. Yeah. So <clears throat> now when, you know, Tom opens up like the way he opens up, I'm sitting, sitting where I'm sitting and I'm thinking, this is over. <laughs> I, yeah. I thought nobody, this, 75 feet plus i'm thinking that's you know that's going to be tough to beat yeah and and it was tough to beat the yeah. um you know that we we didn't give that one away you know those guys full yeah. credit to, to joe and ryan they they earned that um and yeah while it, it hurts to be a few millimeters away from a different result i think i do think and tom and i are now at peace with it when we sit down in 30, 40, 50 years time, you know, when we're sort of old and reminiscing about back in the day, I think we'll be really proud of how we went about that. Um, Tom, Tom opened up with, you know, played his strongest card in the first round and then had essentially the way we viewed it was we got five throws at the world record. Um, let's, let's have a crack. There's no, there was no point taking another, you know, five throws at 2250 because why would you? And, um, you know, so conversations about count back and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Were not, it's not how we go about our business. Um, and you live and die by the sword a little bit on that front, but yeah, certainly no regrets. Tom was in amazing shape. Um, I'll show you a little video here just to, we, we said we we're in Cyprus for our pre-camp. Um, this was a little competition we had with Jacko. Um, this was Tom throwing his all-time PR with a 6.5 kilo shot. Um, so yeah, he was he was in shape. We knew he was in shape when we got to Doha. You know, we were training in the evenings because it was so ridiculously hot there, and um, I think we only had one. We only came into World Champs maybe three days before uh, mm. competition, and um, so we, we had one training session in in Doha and Tom's, Tom's first throw with the 
I think we threw the 7.0, not the 726, 7K flat. And uh, Tom's first throw went like 2280 at half tempo, like just a, a rhythm. And ever since then, we're like, cool, he's in shape, he's ready to go. Um, and yeah, the rest of it was played out how it played out. I mean, there's no point going through it in great detail. We, um, as I said, there's no regrets. I'm, I'm really proud of how Tom went about it and how he handled it because, yeah, it, it hurts um, when you're a competitor to, to get beaten by that much. You know, you hit it. Someone essentially, you know, Tom was the clubhouse leader for, you know, was, for an yeah, hour. Was there and then any, uh, been uh, on the I don't, want, I don't want to stir up any controversy here, but was there any, any thought from Athletics uh, New Zealand to, you know, have them go back and remeasure or, or bring out a steel tape or, I mean, those, they were so, yeah. in my view, they should have given given them all all three of them a gold medal, given them all three, yeah. you know, the, the the winning money, the prize money. Uh, I guess that's not how yeah, it works, it's, but it's not how it works. It's, no, it's I see where you're coming from. We we did yeah. um, appeal afterwards, uh, but it wasn't an appeal against anyone else. It was an appeal yeah. because Tom had a throw that was fouled in the fifth round um, that we didn't think was a foul and. They, I think he got flagged yeah. for egg in the circle before the shot landed or something like that, which which we appealed and that was and got it got overturned on video. It was pretty clear that you know he, he hadn't left the circle, um, and that was twenty two fifty something. Um, so we, we did appeal that, but we didn't never even crossed our mind to appeal against anyone else or get it remeasured. We, in fact, one of the coolest moments was after the drug testing, after the medal ceremony. Uh, it must have been about I don't know two o'clock in the morning or something like that. Uh, all the lights were off at the stadium and as we were walking back out from the under the grandstands there was a door to go out to the track and so we walked out there and um, and Ryan and Mitch Krauser were out there and um, and John DeGarda was out there out on the infield and we walked out and there were these three holes across one right sector one left sector one down the middle of the sector and um, and you couldn't split them you honestly could not oh, split I them I got they, the photo. But yeah, they were, they I were won't clearly. Share. I won't share those, but I got the photo. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, it was, I mean, it was so quite, surreal to, quite yeah. surreal to stand there and soak it in and yeah. go, wow, this is something pretty special just happened. And, <laughs> um, and yeah, to be there and, and take it in, in, in due course, the result will, you know, any, any bitterness or, or frustration around the result will dissolve away and it's already pretty much gone. We're at peace with it, but that certainly. What what Joe and Ryan and, and Tom did that night was um, well, those who okay. those of us who followed the sport will remember that for forever. Throwing the kid from Brazil too, and, and I mean, yeah, he <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, he's probably the one that probably doesn't get enough credit. I mean, to, to yeah, throw what he, he threw and, and not be on the podium is um, he, is ridiculous. He threw over the previous world championship record three times that day. Yeah, <laughs> crazy. That is sport. That's insane. So, oh boy. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, I might have time for one last question and then I've got to go get back in the gym. I've got athletes over there. Whip around. Well we can Yeah. Let them go right by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to hold you up too much, but uh Oh, there we go. Hey, nice. We had a lot of pizza that night. Where's that, that Rob? That was in uh Athens, nice. Georgia. Uh couple of years ago but that you know and what i wanted to say and we what you 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 mentioned this uh deal it's not you know it's not getting to know you through the years and becoming a fr good friend of yours and it, it's it's you know through through all the travels and through all the, the time you spent and and it it ultimately becomes not not how far you throw and how far you, you know, what awards you win it's it's the people you meet and the friendships you made and make and and uh the ventures the ventures you have together so i always appreciated that with uh you and tom and and who's that john in the picture there and reese obviously yeah yeah that's um tom, that's tom looks tiny tom looks small in that picture he does he does he looks you look strong you know, yeah. we ate a lot of pizza but um uh, i guess the the, you're right, and part of that for us is connection to those who've gone before us and those who come after. You know, so 
making an effort to to go and meet guys you know like reese hoffer was my hero coming through and then his those videos training before were at his gym and um you know then to to be able to connect with him he's got a young baby now and so i shoot him a message every now and then and just say how's things going in fatherhood and adam nelson's still in touch with us and like to make sure that i educate my younger athletes you know to what's gone before them and, and even lauren um recently you know connecting her up with lance deal and guys like this to say hey look let learn a bit about the history of your sport and then and then also on the back end of that give give something back so leave something behind give something to to others uh, and if there's anything we can do in that forum um even if it's sharing our training plans and videos and stuff I, i'm comfortable doing that because the days of uh, secret squirrel, you know, training secret. There's no secrets. It's um, it's just we're all in this kind of for the, for the right reasons, and all of the egotistical medals and awards and stuff they all go away. And what you're left with is, um, yeah, stories and relationships, and and that's the stuff we're really trying to treasure. Awesome, coach. Well, that might be a, a great spot to to leave it. We don't want you to be late, and uh, but thank you so much for coming out. Um, you know. It's a pleasure having you out and, and just to hear, you know, your perspective and, and you guys have had some great success and, and come into Olympic year. Can't wait to see a little bit more of it. Um, and unless Rob has anything else, we'll kind of. Yeah, hey, Dale, can you, when we go off the air per se, can you hang on for like 30 seconds? Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And thanks to everyone who's tuned in. Hope everyone is uh, safe and sound around the world at the moment. Thank you, you all. Thanks, Dale. Uh, you guys are good. Thanks a lot, Coach.